All right. Um, hello, uh, I'm George Gerges, a PM on the networking team. I, along with David, who's also a PM on the networking team, uh, will talk to you today about SDN in Azure Stack HCI. So today I'll give uh, sort of a short intro about SDN in HCI. Uh, David will introduce the SDN integration with Azure Kubernetes Service on HCI. Uh, then I'll introduce a new SDN deployment wizard in WAC um, and the new SDN diagnostic script. All right. With that, by the way, I never checked that. You can see my screen just fine and hear me just fine, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, OK, perfect. <laughs> yes, we can see it. Go on, please. Awesome. All right, with that, let me go through a quick overview of SDN and Azure Stack HCI. So I'll start first by uh, talking about the HCI structure and, and how SDN fits in it. So the structure starts here at the bottom uh, with a validated hardware from our partners. This will be in a form of servers that you can get from OEMs like Dell, Lenovo, HP, etc. Um, on that hardware, you would install the HCI operating system, and that will include all the platform features that you need for HCI, uh, whether it's Hyper-V, Storage Space Direct, and Software Defined Networking or SDN. Um, HCI and its features are best managed through Windows Admin Center, but you also can use PowerShell or System Center if you want. And finally, you can connect to Azure Arc and other Azure hybrid services here. As you can see here, SDN and its features are available with the default Azure Stack HCI operating system. You don't need any additional licenses or anything extra to, to deploy SDN. Now, uh, I'll give a short uh, overview of the key capabilities that we support with SDN in Azure Stack HCI. People that are familiar with our SDN solution uh, probably already know that SDN provides customers the ability to bring their own overlay virtual networks for their workloads, which of course sits on top of the underlying physical network. What you might not be aware of is that many of these network policies can also be applied to workloads attached to traditional VLAN networks as well. You can apply microsegmentation policies to protect from internal and external attacks. You can apply quality of service policies to prevent individual workloads from hogging all the bandwidths on host machines. And you can configure load balancing policies to dispute application traffic to multiple backend servers. All of these servers, uh, all of these services, I'm sorry, are applicable to traditional VLAN physical networks. And for users who want to bring their own virtual networks and subnets and attach workloads to them, SDN will provide isolation on multi-tenancy with other customers' networks. And you can also take advantage of the same services that I mentioned for traditional VLAN networks, like microsegmentation again and quality of service policies. If you want to bring your own appliances, uh, something like a, um, an advanced firewall, for example, SDN supports user-defined routing to ensure that traffic to the virtual network is routed through these appliances. And as mentioned before, whether on traditional or virtual networks, you can expose your applications to the internet and configure load balancing for high availability and scale. You can also leverage NAT or network address translation, so you can provide outbound or inbound internet access to your applications hosted on your networks. The last capability here that I'll mention is the backing connectivity through gateways. This is usually needed when you want to connect your virtual networks to external networks. These external networks uh, could be your on-prem data centers located across the internet. It could also be a public cloud like AWS or Azure or any other remote location. We've got a couple of options here. First, if you're connecting to a remote location over the internet, we support encrypt encrypted IPsec connectivity between your virtual network and your remote networks. If you already have a high-speed network, um, 
a private connection between your different locations. Uh, then you don't really need, I guess, the, the encrypted connection. And in that scenario, we support GRE tunnels, which is very similar to IPsec, but without the encryption for connecting of these high speed networks. And finally, if you have workloads in your data center that can um, that cannot be virtualized, some legacy application, for example, but you still want to enable communication between them and your apps hosted on virtual networks, we support L3 Gateway to support that scenario. And that's pretty much in a nutshell that the SDN capabilities in HCI on a high level. Now I'll talk a little bit on the infrastructure of SDN itself and how you enable some of these scenarios. So at the very top here, you have the management plane where you define policy of your network. There is a standard REST interface and there's also PowerShell commandlets on top of that. If you prefer a GUI or a graphical user interface based tool for simplicity, you can use Windows Admin Center or System Center Virtual Machine Manager for configuration and management as well. From the management plane, policy is pushed to a centralized control plane, which is network controller in the case uh, of our SDN solution, uh, that's the component used here for the management plane, the network controller. Um, and the network controller ships as a server role in Azure Stack on the operating system. It receives the policy from management plane and configures the data plane with this policy. Part of the job of network controller as well is to maintain a goal state and remediate configuration drift whenever it happens. And finally, on the data plane side, we have a couple of elements here. Uh, of course, there's Hyper-V host, which gets all the switching and routing policies for virtual networks, all the other network service policies like quality of service and micro segmentation policies, etc. Um, and then all the traffic on-prem networks uh, goes through a component called the uh, SDN gateways. This also ships as a server role in Azure Stack HCI operating system. And then finally, you have the software load balancer component, which also ships as a server role in HCI operating system. Uh, through the software load balancer, all the inbound and outbound internet traffic will go through. So I talked a bit about the SDN capabilities. I talked about the SDN infrastructure required. I'll talk a little bit about how some of these capabilities map to the infrastructure components and what type of deployments do you need to light up uh, specific scenarios? So first of all, network services on traditional networks. We mentioned micro segmentation, quality of service. If customers want to deploy these services on traditional networks, then you only need to deploy the network controller. If you want load balancing on top of that, uh, or network ad uh, address translation capabilities on your traditional networks, then you'll need to deploy the software load balancer or SLD component as well. In the same way, if you're deploying virtual networks or services on SDN virtual networks like micro segmentation, quality of service, uh, service chaining, peering between your networks, then you only need the network controller component. And then also if you want load balancing for your workloads on virtual networks, then again, you will need the software load balancer component. And then finally here, if you want to provide external connectivity from your virtual networks, which could be a remote network or physical workloads in your local data center, then you'll need to add the gateway component. All of, all of these components, all three components, are deployed in VMs. Uh, for network controllers, we recommend having three VMs for high availability. For SLB, we recommend two VMs uh, and two as well for gateways. And uh, just for your reference, this table and guide is also available on the Plan SDM page on our Microsoft Docs if you want to refer to this later. So uh, this is pretty much a high level, uh, a summary of what the key SDN scenarios and what the infrastructure requirements for some of these scenarios. And with that, I'll hand it over to David, uh, who will talk to us about uh, Kubernetes, Azure Kubernetes Service and Azure Stack HCI. All right, awesome. Let, Thank you, George. Uh, let me uh, give you access here.
Mm. Can you request access? Uh, yeah, I have request access. Or can I actually share? I'll just share on my. Yeah, okay. That's, uh, that's perfect. I think when we continue in a moment. Yeah, if nobody shares the screen, this is shown the event will continue in a moment. So I will switch on our video till we have a new screen. And there yeah. it is. <laughs> or? Yeah. There it is, but it's not in presenter mode actually. David, can I already share it? One second. David, we don't hear you. No, now the screen is gone. David, we see you, but uh, we don't see your screen. Uh, let's see. Do you see the screen now? Now no, we, we have a screen, it. yes. Okay, excellent. Sure, I have the audio and now the screen. We see your screen, you can go on. Right. Sorry about that. Uh, so, all right, so let's get started on this. Uh, what is Azure Kubernetes service on Azure Stack HCI? So uh, I think you've just seen a presentation on this, but basically AKS HCI is a managed Kubernetes platform available in Azure Stack HCI and on the server. Uh, its goal is to enable users to manage the lifecycle of Kubernetes clusters uh, through an experience that is simple and secure by default, but also consistent with AKS on Azure. Essentially, it provides a solution that is easy to deploy and manage for any customers with an existing investment in the server or Azure Stack HCI. Uh, we don't have uh, enough time to give a more in-depth overview um, but as you've just seen, there's more sessions about this to familiarize yourself with AKS on Azure Stack HCI, as well as documentation. And going forward, we will assume some basic familiarity with. Uh, SDN support brings many exciting features that will improve application portability between AKS and AKS on HCI and deliver a consistent experience. So the first bullet point that you see here is that SDN brings true virtual networking support. So without SDN, AKS HCI VMs today attach directly to your physical network, which means scaling out will also have an impact on your physical network. With SDN, you can create overlay networks that use the XLAN encapsulation and are essentially equivalent to the Azure VNet that you're used to in the Azure public cloud. So using SDN means you'll not be bottlenecked on having to do changes to your physical network, like carving out new VLANs for new clusters or similar things uh, when trying to scale out and add new uh, Kubernetes clusters. Um, as a consequence of that, uh, SDN will also introduce Azure CNI support into AKS HCI, which is, um, you may, might have heard of it, is the networking solution for pods already used uh, by AKS today. And what that means is essentially any networking enhancements or any fixes that go into Azure CNI for AKS will also light up in AKS on HCI. So that is a big consistency improvement over the current experience with uh, flannel or calico as the choices for CNI. Um, finally, there are also many more, you know, Azure networking concepts that translate directly into SDN that you see on the screen, like software load balancers equivalent to Azure load balancer, user defined routes or UDRs and ACLs. So SDN provides many similar concepts that people are used to in the Azure public cloud as well. Uh, the second uh, pillar, so to speak, of AKS on HCI is hybrid by design AKS in your data center. So SDN support in AKS HCI will also improve the experience on that front 
by uh, you know essentially enabling connectivity from pods that might be running on premise, you know, on AKS on HCI into actual uh, remote Azure vNets, uh, for example, through the STN virtual gateway that George has mentioned earlier. Uh, so this powerful feature enables um, you know, some many exciting scenarios such as uh, scaling out into Azure with direct connecti connectivity into these services that would otherwise only be available in that remote Azure vNet. Uh, the third promise of AKS on HCI is built-in security and default security. Uh, so again, SDN is a unified solution that's maintained by Microsoft. There's no dependency on third parties. Um, it's a robust and mature networking stack that's uh, already, uh, you know, it has been around for a while, so it's it's been tested and battle hardened. And it also, of course, provides many uh, features such as uh, network isolation, uh, between virtual networks, a distributed firewall that allows you to define access control lists, to manage network traffic, or uh, even you know control traffic flow through user-defined routes. So we believe enabling SDN and AKS HCI improves security and reduces attack vectors from a security standpoint. Uh, the fourth pillar is building a modern platform for .NET applications and containers. So again, SDN minimizes operational complexity. It offers, offers um, you know, this converged network infrastructure that manages all network devices and appliances in the data center, you know, whether that's VMs or containers running in, in Kubernetes, all of that can be managed kind of under this single pane of glass. And through that, SDN offers, you know, basically a simplified support matrix. Um, in most cases, there should not be a need to stitch together various other solutions that need to be configured to interoperate with each other, like custom F5 load balancers or other load balancer solutions, et cetera, because SDN provides many of those capabilities already. And finally, there's many advanced features that George uh, covered earlier um, needed to operate applications in a modern data center, you know, from quas policies, virtual network peering, NIC teaming, and more. So let's take a look at the architecture as well of AKS HCI, both without SDN and with SDN. So what you see on the screen right now is a very simplified diagram of AKS HCI. Uh, it can be essentially broken down into two major parts. Uh, the first on the left here in that gray dotted box that you see is to deploy the uh, platform services, also known as the management cluster. Uh, what this management cluster does is, is essentially uh, it creates a VMs that would control the deployment and management of additional clusters, the workload clusters or target clusters as they're known, which is the dotted box on the right that you see here. So essentially what I'm saying is we create one Kubernetes cluster that will drive the creation and management of other Kubernetes clusters and additional clusters. And the workload cluster is the actual one um, where you run your applications and workloads, as you see in this uh, dotted orange box right here. And uh, when you ask AKS HCI to provision a cluster, one thing or one commonality that you might notice is that it will automatically deploy VMs that act as the control plane for that cluster, including at least one VM that contains the API server of the Kubernetes cluster and a VM which serves as the load balancer so, uh, you know, for better availability, that's needed because the API server is the entry point for all resource operations. Uh, the load balancer solution used today in uh, AKS HCI without SDN is HA proxy of Keep Alive D. Uh, so, yeah, that's an overview of AKS HCI without SDN. So, what does this picture look like with SDN? Uh, so, with SDN, we have uh, SDN infrastructure that gets created. Uh, beforehand and it's created once and it can be leveraged by all additional clusters that are created afterwards for all their networking needs. With SDN there's a less overhead for each cluster because uh, again there's no need to provision these uh, separate HA proxy load balancer VMs since uh, you know we can reuse the SDN software load balancer already for you know load balancing purposes. Um, also all the VMs in a, a particular cluster, uh, cluster can be attached to a SDN virtual network with isolation optionally configured between clusters, and they're uh, you know, able to use all the feature sets uh, 
of SDN that would otherwise not be available in AKS HCI. Um, so the second big enhancement that you might notice in the uh, orange dotted box uh, and for the worker nodes right here is that uh, we can introduce Azure CNI networking support, which essentially allows the pods or containers to attach to the SDN virtual network as well. And so in that case, uh, you can use the SDN features not only for the VMs in your data center and your Kubernetes VMs, but you can use it all the way through to the application containers inside those Kubernetes clusters as well. And so finally, the last point uh, is that all the SDN infrastructure components can also be replicated for high availability and reliability as well. Uh, so Without further ado, let's jump into the demo to showcase the creation of AKS HCI on an SDN environment. Uh, so I do have audio here. Uh, let me know if you can hear it or not. Are you able to hear that? No, unfortunately not. Okay. Uh, can you speak over the video? <laughs> Does. It's <laughs> that will be a bit tricky. Right, one second. It will take one minute. I'm sorry about this. Not a problem. Okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, in the moment, yes. Uh, I hope. Uh, can the audience? HCI cluster. So let's take a look at the uh, environment we will use to demo AKSH. Can you hear that? I can hear it, but I'm not sure. Same. I don't see your screen. Uh, do the other, uh, can someone uh, uh, give us an, a feedback in the Q&A um, if they see and hear, uh, David? Uh, I see and hear the demo. Okay, that's great. So then go on, please, David. Okay, apologies for the logistics. So let's take a look at the uh, environment we will use to demo AKS HCI with SDN. What you see here is a typical four node HCI cluster with a few virtual machines deployed. Uh, so uh, we can view them in Hyper-V Manager as well. You can see network controller here, MUX and gateway VMs. So that is the SDN infrastructure that we provisioned already. Uh, so this environment is, uh, meets all the requirements for AKS HCI and SDN, so it's ready for deployment. The first step to deploy AKS HCI is to define the network settings used by SDN. So we've expanded this uh, commandlet that's already available in AKS HCI with SDN support, and essentially you pass in the SDN virtual network in the node IP pool parameter, and you also pass in the logical network used uh, as the VIP pool by the load balancer. But enough uh, PowerPoint, let's actually put this into practice. Uh, so what you see here is a PowerShell window uh, with this new AKS HCI network settings uh, commandlet. Uh, we, in our case, we have uh, actually already pre-created a virtual network previously that we want to use with AKS HCI, but ultimately the experience we're targeting will also create one for you if you are not passing one that's already pre-created. Uh, so yeah, let's run that. And that's all there is really to the first step. So the next step consists of defining the AKS HCI configuration that will be used. Again, there is a PowerShell function that does that, which we've extended with SDN support. We pass in our previously created VNet object, and we also uh, enable network controller as well as pass in the uh, the references to the virtual network and the logical network that we're using, as well as the network controller, uh, REST endpoint and certificate name. So let's actually put this to practice. Uh, we have the same commandlet here right now on the screen. So what this will do is basically um, set up the configuration for the various AKS HCI subsystems uh, like Cloud Agent, Mock and KVA and it will get us ready for installation. So the next final step before we can actually install is to register our resource group with uh, Azure using Arc. So this means that our Kubernetes cluster, which we will ultimately create, will 
show up in the Azure portal, and we can use uh, use that to basically deploy uh, resources to the cluster. And yeah, now that we've uh, configured everything, we're ready to actually deploy AKS HCI and create the management cluster that will be used to create the target clusters. So now that the AKS HCI installation has completed, we can see that there was a management cluster here consisting of a single VM, which hosts our control plane. And um, yeah, we can also take a sneak peek inside it, view what are the pods that are running there, make sure everything is running and healthy. Uh, so let's print those. Uh, there's quite a lot of them because again, uh, this is the management cluster control plane. So it contains all the custom resource definitions for cluster API and all the controllers that are used to create uh, workload clusters or target clusters. Uh, we can also see that uh, there was a load balancer created. So again, this is the API server entry point. It should be highly available. And uh, hence we have a SDN load balancer policy that was configured. You can see the corresponding resource here. Also note that's using the uh, IP address range that we previously specified in the VIP pool in the first step. Um, and yeah, we also have a, of course, the VM is attached to a virtual network, so we can see the corresponding network interface resource has been created here as well. And the IP address should also show up in Hyper-V Manager. So next, now that we've uh, looked at our management cluster, we'll look at creating the actual workload cluster where our applications will run. We'll be creating a workload cluster with one Windows node and one Linux node. Now that the uh, workload cluster is completed, we have uh, node pools for Linux and Windows, uh, each with you know just one node, one Windows node, one Linux node, and one control plane for the workload cluster as well. Uh, we should see three new VMs that were created. You can see those here uh, spread across our nodes and our HCI machines. Uh, so yeah, that's the control plane, which is here. Um, let's take a look. We can view what are all the pods that are running as well. You can see these running here. Note that we do have Calico for pod networking set up here, uh, but we are aiming to light up Azure CNI for SDN uh, capable clusters. You can also view the nodes here. Those are all ready as well. Uh, however, what was also done was, um, you know, same as with the management cluster, we have a load balancer resource created for the API server on the workload cluster control plane. And uh, we also have network interfaces that were created for each of the VMs and attached to the SDN virtual network. Let's just highlight those. Uh, here's a Linux network interface attached to the virtual network and uh, here is also a windows network interface so yeah that concludes the section on workload cluster creation and next up is actual deployment so the very first application we will showcase is nginx on linux uh, with five replicas and we'll also be creating a load balancer resource so we'll showcase the sdn integration uh, with SLB uh, as well here. So let's actually deploy this now. We see there was a deployment and the service resource submitted to Kubernetes. You can view uh, what the state is of that. Service is pending an external IP. It takes a few seconds. And uh, here we can see the SLB provisioned external IP. And uh, going into SDN Explorer, we can also see this here. Uh, there is a load balancer resource created here for the Linux web server. Now uh, let's actually try to fetch that IP address and uh, punch it into the trustworthy Internet Explorer. 
uh, we'll see that the application is up and running. And so what this shows is even though the pods themselves are not attached to an SDN virtual network, uh, the nodes are, and as we've just shown earlier. And so what that means is essentially there's uh, two layers of load balancing at play. One is the external load balancer, which is uh, the basically the SDN load balancer is uh, redirecting the traffic to the nodes, at which point the internal load balancing uh, of Kubernetes uh, provided by kubeproxy kicks in and uh, redirects the traffic to the uh, backend destination pods. And so that allows you to view the page that as we've just shown. Now this demo wouldn't be complete if we just showed Linux, so let's show an IIS web server uh, on Windows as well. And so let's deploy that. It's very similar to what we've just shown. You can wait for that external IP to pop up. All right, we see we got 109. Just to show that in SDN Explorer as well, you can see that highlighted here. Uh, we can also see, you know, taking a closer look, we can see the front end port is port 80 and backend port is set to the node port actually that we see in Kubernetes. Uh, now let's punch that into Internet Explorer as well. Uh, 109, let's wait for it to load and here we can see the IIS page. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the demo of AKS HCI on SDN. All right. So let's take a look. That was the end of that. <laughs> uh, all right, so last but not least, uh, we I wanted to share the roadmap as well. Uh, so we have a private preview of essentially the feature we've just demoed and shown uh, coming soon this year. Uh, we have a sign up as well that you can see, uh, aka.ms slash SDN dash sign up that you can sign up for if you're interested in registering with the private preview. Um, just asking some very basic questions, just your name and email and optionally some inf more information on what features you're interested in using. Uh, we also have some design optimizations coming. Uh, so for example, um, if you saw in the demo, we had a virtual network that was pre-created. Uh, we're trying to remove that requirement so that AKS HCI will provision one on your behalf. Uh, finally, uh, in the demo, what you've seen was uh, actually not using Azure CNI, and the uh, pods were not attached to the SDN virtual network. So that is a feature that uh, we're working on and actually already at the testing stage already that looks promising as well. However, it does require an Azure Stack HCI 21H2 host for this feature to work. And uh, last but not least, the demo showed a lot of PowerShell and commandlets, uh, I know about that. Uh, we're trying to light up this experience through a GUI as well and Windows Admin Center as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's that. Without further ado, I'll give control back to George. Uh, and yeah, he'll talk about diagnostic improvements. All right. Yeah. Thanks, David. Um, so yeah, I'll, uh, I'll talk about uh, a new SDN deployment um, wizard here and uh, also a new SDN script. First, let me start with uh, SDN deployment. So earlier this year, the HCI cluster deployment wizard was released. Uh, it looked something like this. Uh, you could go and add um, your cluster. I'm sorry, I think it's shifted one more slide. Would you like me to go back for you or? Um, I uh, give me a second. I'm not sure here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm trying to go back. Uh, 
there's a lot of lag I see here. All right, let's try this again. All right, so as I was saying, there was the HCI deployment wizard, um, and it looked something like this. You could go, um, click add here and create a new cluster, and through this wizard, you're able to deploy your cluster, hyper converse storage, and for the last step, you could control S uh, you could uh, deploy SDN. I'm sorry, um, but there's one main limitation here in this wizard, or that experience, uh, is that what do I do if I already have a cluster and I just want to deploy SDN on its own? The way to do that was still through the SDN script or through SCVMA. Uh, but today here we are. Uh, today here I'm uh, introducing a new simple experience through WAC that will enable you to deploy SDN on its own after adding your cluster. Uh, and through this demo, we'll get to take a look at it in action. Uh -oh. Uh, David, I, I think I'll present uh, from here and see if, if that works better for me. Sure. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Yes, yes we do. Yes. Uh, now it's gone. We had your. We had your screen. You, you see it now. Now it's there. Yes. Can we already share it? Yeah. Okay. A, okay perfect. All right. Uh, so let's take a look at the demo. Hello. In this demo, we will showcase the new network controller deployment. wizard. First, I'll add my cluster that doesn't have SDN deployed on it yet. Here in the list of extensions, you'll see that since I don't have SDN deployed, I will not find any of the SDN extensions yet, except for the SDN infrastructure extension. If I go to it, I can hit get started here and start the network controller deployment. The network controller service gets deployed on a cluster of virtual machines. On this page, you'll need to specify some settings for this cluster. Here, you can change the default name of your network controller cluster, and then add the path for the VHDX that will be used to deploy the NCVMs. This should be the same build that is deployed on your nodes. Then Go on. you can choose the switch. You'll need to use an external Hyper-V virtual switch with at least one physical adapter connected to the management logical network. The default here is to deploy at least three NCVMs, so they're highly available. And here you can specify the VLAN ID of the VMs. Your NCVMs should have the same VLAN ID as your management network adapters, so that's what we'll add here. You can also change the default parameters for the VM's info. And of course, you'll add here your credentials. And finally, these advanced options, VM location, Mac pool, will also be populated for you, but you can, of course, change them. Then the next step is deployment. I'll let this run here for about 20 minutes. And of course, I'll fast forward for the sake of the demo. If for any reason the deployment failed at any stage, just go to your nodes and delete the VMs with their VHDXs and go through the wizard again. But here I'll hit finish. And that's pretty much it. The page will refresh and you'll be able to see the rest of the SDN extensions 
and the health of the SDN infrastructure and the infrastructure extension. With a network controller deployed, you can now create virtual networks and leverage user-defined networking with your virtual networks. You can also take advantage of micro-segmentation and quality of service policies with your virtual network as well as your traditional VLAN networks. That concludes our demo. Thanks for watching. All right. Um, so that was pretty much the wizard. As you can see, it's a, it's a very simple wizard um, that you can go through. And uh, again, it solves the issue is that if you have already an HCI cluster, you don't need to deploy it. You just need to deploy SDN. You can just go to the extension after the fact and deploy SDN. Hello. As for future plans here, uh, you'll notice that currently there's no way to deploy SLB or gateways through WAC, neither from the HCI cluster creation wizard nor from the wizard and SDN infrastructure extension. But we are planning to add these wizards to deploy both components in the SDN infrastructure extension um, in, the, in, the tabs, in the tabs for SLB and gateways respectively, I guess. Um, SLB here, as we mentioned before, will allow you to configure load balancing and NAT rules, and the gateway component, of course, will allow you to create the GRE, IPsec, and L3 gateway connections. Um, until we add these wizards, you can still deploy the components after deploying NC uh, through the SDN Express script. The script, of course, is available on GitHub, as a lot of you know, and uh, it has a lot of sample configuration files for the different types of deployments that you may want to have. As far as this wizard goes, we will have uh, private builds available by next week, and we're hoping to uh, have this wizard publicly available within two weeks. And I'll, I'll definitely publish a blog about it, a blog post about it, so um, people are aware that it's now available. Next, let's talk a little about uh, diagnostics. So because of SDN's complexity here, um, it could really get hard to diagnose, and that's why we're releasing the SDN Diagnostics script. This is pretty much an open source script available in GitHub and PowerShell Gallery that will allow you to first validate your SDN infrastructure, identify known issues, and finally collect diagnostic logs for analysis. Before we see the script uh, in, in a demo, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about the structure of the script, uh, then we'll get to see it in action. So first of all, uh, the script is very lightweight. All it needs for input uh, is the NCVM name and then figures out pretty much everything else for you in the background by running uh, queries in the background. Uh, so yeah, most commands take only the NCVM name as an input or NCORI. And uh, as for the structure of the script, uh, you can say that it can be broken down into three main sub modules. First, the health module, um, and through the health module, you'll be able to run health tests that will validate the states of the S different SDN components and services. This will return the status, of course, of the validation, whether it's success or failure, and if it's a failure, it returns parameters relevant to the failed uh, component or service. The next module here is the known issues. It's very similar to the health module, um, but instead of just generic SDN health uh, validations, it has very specific tests for specific issues that we have seen before. For example, um, it makes sure that you don't have more than one network adapter in the NC network with the same MAC address. Or for example, that the partition size of each service is within the right limits. And finally, here is the log collection piece. Uh, this module here, this last piece, will allow you to collect all the diagnostics data that you could imagine for SDN. Uh, this data, of course, can be analyzed to resolve SDN issues. And without further ado, let's take a look at the demo. Hello. In this demo, we will install and run basic commands from the SDN diagnostics script. The script is available on GitHub and PowerShell Gallery, and instructions to install and run it are on the GitHub Wiki. Now, let's get started. To install the module, I'll run the install module command here. 
and then import it. With these last two commands, the module will copy and install itself to every SDN machine on your SDN environment. And now we're ready to use it. The first command that I'll use here will run the SDN health validations, and it only takes the name of any NCVM as an input. If you want to focus on a single component, just add the parameter role, and then you can choose whichever component you want to diagnose. But I will validate everything here. You'll see here that the module will start validating the configuration and provisioning state of the gateways, SLB muxes and network controller, as well as the services and configurations on the host. And you will notice here that we actually have two failures. The parameters are pointing us directly to the failed services or states, and there are more details in yellow up in the output. If you want even more details, Everything that the module runs is stored with the results in a log in this path. You'll see here the same failure pointed out. And the log also points you to a cache here where the result is stored as an object and can be retrieved without rerunning the validations. And it can also be used in this way to get the same details about the result. Now that we see here that the failure is for sure that the SLB host Asian service is not running, let's go ahead and start it. And if we run the same validation command here, we will see that everything goes through this time. Next, we're going to see how to identify known issues. In the same way, this module tests for known issues and it also takes the name of any NCVM as an input. And the same parameters apply if you want to check the known issues for a single component or even if you want to run a single test. And we'll see here that we don't have any of the known issues. Here, you can also use the get command to enumerate all the commands in the module. Then you can take a look at all the available tests. You can also see the get commands that collect SDN data by running queries in the background. Soon, there will be an overarching data collection command that will allow you to collect the data from all these get commands, get all the relevant ETW events, network traces and logs, as well as the validations results, and organize all these logs in a folder. Until then, you can take advantage of these commands individually. The value added here is that, first of all, the commands are a lot simpler than the original queries. The module only gets the NC name or URI as an input and figures out the rest of the parameters. Secondly, the module parses the output and displays it in a more user-friendly way. For example, this is how you get the health information for the service fabric cluster from network controller. Finally, the module also stores this output in a PowerShell object, so you can use this output in however way you want if you're running a more advanced diagnostic script. In this demo, we covered some basic functionality of the script, but there's a lot more left. And the script will continue to improve and evolve as we and the community contribute to it. Take the time to explore the module and make sure you're running the latest version. Thank you for listening. All right, and that was pretty much uh, uh, the demo about the script. Uh, and like mentioned in the script, it's it's only a portion of what the script can do and the capabilities. Uh, you can use the get command here to um, enumerate all the commands that, uh, that are available in that module. And the script will always be work in progress, right? We uh, will always continue to contribute to it and uh, hopefully well, the community also will continue to contribute to it. And as new issues come up, there will uh, there will need to be new tests in the script pretty much for them. Um, but as much of, as far as like the bigger plans here that we're having, as mentioned in the demo, we're planning to have a more comprehensive data collection command. Uh, this command again will pretty much be the one command you can go to and uh, it will call all the get commands, all the validations, and uh, just organize all the app in a folder for you. And uh, 
Second of all here, we have, uh, we're planning to integrate the script with Windows Admin Center for a simpler experience and uh, for a more user-friendly app. And finally here, we're adding, we're, we're planning to add a little bit of insights or pointers to documentation that will help you resolve your issues based on the output from that you get from that tool. So you run the tool now and you see that, oh, um, my environment is busted exactly in this spot. Um, next, we're planning to add specific documentation that will tell you, you see this, you see X, you do Y, and then you'll be good. I really encourage whoever can to contribute to the script. Uh, the script, as I mentioned, is open source in GitHub. Um, it's very modular and granular. Uh, you don't need to understand every bit of the script to contribute to it. Uh, just, I guess, the, the main structure of it. And there's a very good documentation how to contribute to it uh, with specific commands on how to create new functions and specify the function parameters that will create a new file for you and uh, with the right template and, and add the references for your function wherever needed. Here, uh, these are just uh, some of the links where you can find the script uh, whether in, uh, or references to it in, uh, in GitHub, uh, where you'll find the script and the wiki that has documentation about it, and uh, in PowerShell Gallery and on NuGet. The script was actually released publicly yesterday, so you can go and play around with it today if you want. Um, and yeah, I would definitely appreciate feedback or even uh, raise bugs through the GitHub issues. And with that, I'll open the floor for questions. Yeah, thanks guys. This was really a great session. I, I, I really love what I've seen, especially um, the uh, wizard that you after the fact can add SDN to uh, to an Azure Stack HCI cluster because this was something I I really wanted because um, if you want this stuff later, great. Um, I have a question for you. So I saw you you answered uh, the questions already in the Q and A. So my question is. Um, Azure Stack HCI for me is a lot of times stretch cluster and uh, so far uh, SDN is not supported in stretch, stretch cluster. I understand it's maybe very complex, but have you plans to uh, to uh, plans to to add that to the roadmap and uh, give us some insight when uh, if you do that and maybe when? Yeah, uh, I can take that Karsten. This is Anirban. Yeah, so, hi Aruban. Great question. Hi, great question. And if if you ask me, that's probably the biggest request from our HCI customers today. And um, we are getting requests from multiple fronts, especially for customers who have clusters across multiple locations and then customers who are having stretch clusters today. We are working on this. I cannot. Yeah, uh, I cannot give a timeline yet, but we are definitely working on this. Hopefully we should be able to announce something soon. But uh, yeah. but yes, this is definitely on top of our mind. Yeah, uh, I ask this because most of the Azure Stack uh, HCI implementations I do today in, in Germany, we are big at stretch clusters. I, I don't know why, but uh, they are the, the, the main driver in Germany for, for Azure Stack HCI is stretch cluster scenarios. And uh, it would be great if we uh, have SDN here because the SDN, the number of SDN deployments or even questions about it, they are very low and I think it helps a lot if you integrate it in uh, in an admin center and you are going uh, that I see. So that's very important So that's that it is easy to deploy and also to manage. Uh, Manfred would agree, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, so you are doing great work here and uh, I, I, I really lo liked what I see because I'm a little bit tired already. It's 10 a. 10 a.m. in Germany, 10 p.m. in Germany, and we had a long day. We are nine hours uh, in the show now. No, 10, 10 actually. Yeah, 10 hours, yes. Wow, and we have that, still two to long. go. So, um, great stuff. Uh, what was the question you had most in the Q and A? Because you answered them, and uh, we didn't see them. So, uh, can you elaborate on that? We have still four minutes uh, yeah. uh, until the next session. Uh, sure. Um, the last one at least was related to Windows updates uh, and there was a good question as to how do we update SDN uh, infrastructure, right? So uh, today this is uh, if you 
if you remember that all the SDN infrastructure is on Azure Stack HCI operating system, so uh, you don't need a separate license. And to update the SDN infrastructure, you simply use standard Windows update tools. This could be PowerShell, or if you are using the sconfig UI, you can use that, or you can use Windows Admin Center to you know, uh, log on to that machine and update it as well. Mm -hmm. There will be a follow-up question, if not vocally, but in your mind, that how about integration with cl you know, cluster-aware update? Yeah. Today, cluster aware updating only updates the hosts and they are planning to include support for VMs soon. And we are very tightly talking with them and this this integration with SDN VMs is also planned. So hopefully sometime in the very near future. Yeah, cool. I, I have another question. Uh, you know, so you deploy, uh, for example, three network controllers. Um, yes. And uh, I think you need them for the, for the functionality of the SDN network. Or uh, um, so, do you spread them over different nodes and uh, make sure they are not landing on the same node? Do you do you do that, or or does it work without yes. the network controller? Right. So, so network controller uses a very standard technology underneath for hosting called Service Fabric, and this is a very uh, common Azure technology. So the way Service Fabric works is that it creates multiple replicas. So you have multiple microservices in Network Controller. Like one microservice will take care of your software load balancing. Another microservice will take care of your routing and switching policies and so on. So Service Fabric um, distributes the microservices across the multiple nodes. And when a particular node goes down, it shifts the microservices to a different node. Each microservices has a uh, one primary replica and two secondary replicas, so that even when a primary goes down, it automatically comes up on the next node, and you do not see any kind of disruption or data loss. Very, so, very uh, cool. So yeah, yeah, that's how it does that today. Yeah, and I I liked a lot the Kubernetes integration of SDN, and as far as I learned, uh, we can use the load balancer from SDN. Uh, it's an option, so. Uh, what I what I've seen, I'm very excited, and I'm I I will I will uh, I will try to get into the private pu uh, preview program if I have time. So very very curious about this stuff. 